Uh, I would like to welcome everyone, our panelists, uh, all of our guests this afternoon, this evening from all around the world, uh, joining us for this last uh, program in the series curated by Jeffrey Herf on the origins and ideology of Hamas. The first two programs can be found uh, if you wish to uh, uh, participate, uh, if you wish to view them on YouTube, uh, where uh, something like 16,000 people have uh, watched the programs. Uh, these programs under the, under the curation of uh, Professor Herf have in uh, some ways galvanized uh, the YIVO community at a time when the Jewish world is being split in all kinds of directions that uh, both uh, appear uh, portentous of, of further fractures, uh, dangerous uh, families are being split apart over many of these issues. And I do want to say just briefly before we get to the panel that in my conversations with so many of those who have called uh, the, this series into question. What I've discovered is uh, a, a kind of woeful lack of historical knowledge, uh, of basic facts about the founding of Israel, about the nature of I Islamism, about the difference between PLO and Hamas, uh, about the origins of uh, uh, anti-Semitism in the uh, Islamic world. And while many uh, call for balance, that is to say, in order for a program to have meaning, there has to be correct balance uh, between uh, left-wing and right-wing, between pro-Israel and anti-Israel, it may be that what we need rather is knowledge in addition to balance. And I don't want to sound too portentous or, 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 or too homiletic, but there is a tradition uh, which uh, uh, we honor in the Jewish community that goes back to the prophets. And one of the prophets, Hosea wrote, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I think that applies as much today as it did 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And so these programs are designed to help to restore knowledge to the conversation. And with that, I will turn things over to Jeffrey, who will introduce our panelists for today. Jeffrey. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jonathan Brent and the staff <clears throat> of YIVO for making this series possible. Uh, and uh, for making it possible to attract uh, the audience of the remarkable size that Jonathan mentioned. Uh, so in these three, uh, in, in this webinar series, uh, YIVO has made a huge contribution to bridging the gap between scholarship and a broader audience. And it's our hope uh, that uh, in this coming summer and in the fall, as professors and teachers are putting their course syllabi together, that they will remember the authors and the texts that uh, we have discussed uh, and, and make them required reading in the courses that they're teaching. Uh, today's panel concludes this uh, series of three webinars. Each of today's panelists is a distinguished scholar and merits a full hour of their own. But we decided that three webinars uh, was already a lot to undertake. And we hope the brief introductions to today's speakers will encourage all of you who are listening and viewing uh, to read their work. Uh, in the next week or so, uh, uh, we will post a bibliography of work that has appeared in the YIVO webinars and other works. It's a, it's a, a list of scholarship that uh, uh, dissents uh, from some of what is heard in the colleges and universities these days. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, 
when the rubber meets the road, either of these works are going to appear as required reading on courses in Europe and Britain and the United States, or Britain is part of Europe in my view, but uh, uh, or not. I hope they will. Um, so I will uh, introduce each speaker uh, in order. First, Meyer Litback, then Norman Goda, Karen Stogner, and David Hirsch. Um, Meyer Litback. Uh, we are very, very pleased that Meyer is with us today. He is professor in the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at the, at the Tel Aviv University, where he teaches and does research on modern Iranian, Iranian and Shia history and the history of modern Islamist movements. His most well-known book publication in the United States uh, was a co-authored work published in 2009 with uh, uh, with the with the late and splendid uh, Esther Webman entitled From Empathy to Denial, a Arabic Responses to the Holocaust. Those of you who have not had a chance to read the book, I highly recommend it. Uh, he also is the author of Know Thy Enemy, Evolving Attitudes Towards Others in Modern, Modern Shia Thought and Practice of 2021. And uh, in 1998, 1998, Meyer Litvak published in the Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, The Islamization of the Israeli-Arab Conflict, The Case of Hamas. Meyer, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you and good afternoon and thank you for having me. Uh, I will talk about uh, Hamas, its ideology and anti-Semitism. Anti anti uh, let me say briefly, uh, Hamas is the local branch of the Palestinian of the Muslim Brother Movement, uh, first branch of uh, Muslim Brother Movements in Palestine were established in 1946. Um, but uh, uh, after 1948, uh, even though the Muslim Brothers advocated the elimination of Israel and also advocated anti-Semitic ideology, they did not um, advocate fighting against Israel, Israel because they saw Israel as a symptom of a much deeper malaise of the Muslim world. Hamas emerged in 1987, following the outbreak of the First Palestinian Intifada, or uprising against Israel, uh, when it was under pressure from its younger generation to join the struggle against Israel. And then the Muslim Brothers established the armed wing, which they called Hamas. Hamas is also an, ac an acronym of the words Harakat al-Mukawam al-Islamiyah, or the Islamic Resistance Movement. Hamas, the name itself, is enthusiasm. Now, Hamas is both a Islamist movement and also a Palestinian nationalist movement. The importance of Hamas is that, uh, unlike the PLO, Hamas frames the conflict between Arabs and Jews in Eretz Israel or Palestine as a religious conflict, not as a national conflict. Hamas argues that the conflict is not, not about land, it is about religion. It is a conflict between Islam and Judaism. Islam representing uh, absolute good or the party of God, Hezbollah, and Judaism representing absolute evil or the party of Satan, Hezbollah Shaitan. The struggle is over the religious identity of, of Palestine, whereas the Muslims want to hoist Allah's flag on Palestine, the Jews want to build their false temple in Jerusalem and to destroy Islam. More than that, the Jews are not, do not simply want to take over Palestine and, be, and destroy Al-Aqsa Mosque and build the temple. The Jews also want to take revenge against the East Muslims for the, their past defeats from uh, the Prophet Muhammad. Now, Hamas regards the struggle between Islam and Judaism as emanating from two sources. One is indeed the conflict between Muslims and Jews from the times of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the Prophet uh, had uh, conflict or fought the Jewish tribes of Medina. He had defeated the three Jewish tribes of Medina, expelled two of them, massacred the third one. The Jews want to take revenge over their previous defeats. And the Jews also want to take over those areas in what is today Arabian Peninsula that had been theirs in the past. Most important is an oasis called Khaybar, which I will mention later. This is one source. The other source is a thousand year long uh, 
Western imperialist offensive against Islam, in which the West, which is also includes the Jews, uh, has been trying to destroy, undermine, and subjugate Islam in order to spread Western ideology, Western culture. Uh, Zionism is simply the culmination of this thousand year long Western struggle against Islam. Zionism is sometimes described as a tool which the West has been, have been using against Islam in order to subjugate, split, fragment the Muslims and to bring them under Western domination. Sometimes, by the way, Zionism is in fact the tail wagging the dog, uh, leading the West to fight against Islam. Now, uh, in order as why since the since Hamas, since Hamas and other Islamic movements as well uh, frame the conflict as religious one, it becomes a struggle between absolutes, absolutes good and absolute evil, in which there can be no compromise. You don't compromise with Satan. Such uh, dichotomy also leads, of course, to the demonization of the other side of the Jews. And here you can, you can see that Hamas anti-Semitism borrows from two elements or relies on two elements. One is traditional Islamic anti-Judaism. I make a distinction between traditional Muslim anti-Judaism, which is religious prejudice, and modern anti-Semitism. Now, the, from Islamic, traditional Islamic anti-Judaism, Hamas borrows anti-Jewish themes, such as describing the Jews as liars, deceivers, um, stingy, uh, killers of the prophets, uh, and immoral uh, people who defied God in general. This is from uh, er earlier Islamic traditions. From modern anti-Semitism, Islam, even though it rejects Western culture and it rejects Western influence on Islam, never had any problem borrowing uh, uh, motifs from modern anti-Semitism. From modern anti-Semitism, I would say the two most important features of Hamas anti-Semitism is one is the absorption of the notorious Protocols of Deals of Zion as an authentic, true document which truly describes the evil nature and the evil plans of the Jews to take over the world. And therefore, Hamas describes, for instance, the Jews as being the force behind every major war in modern history. The Jews fomented the First World War in order to destroy the Ottoman Empire. The Jews fomented the Second World War uh, in order to destroy Germany. By the way, all the First of all, also to uh, destroy the Russian Empire. And uh, by doing both, they, they were able to get uh, the Balfour Declaration. And I have to say that I, and I also tell my students, I never understood if we, the Jews, were so smart and were able to foment the First World War. Why did we take uh, the tiny, dry land of Palestine instead of taking a much better land for, for ourselves? Uh, the Jews have also been behind every major revolution in history, from the French Revolution to the Bolshevik Revolution and, and other revolutions. Jews control the world media, they control the world acad academia, banks, they are behind every major crime organization and uh, of, you know, smuggling alcohol and drugs, basically in order to destroy societies from, from within. So the protocols, and Hamas quotes the protocols extensively, and for Hamas, the protocols of theirs of Zion are an authentic document which describes the nature of the Jews. Another important document uh, theme is um, bl the blood libel against the Jews, Jews using blood for uh, ritual purposes. Uh, another element you can say of modern anti-Semitism is uh, Hamas uh, expressing uh, uh, Holocaust denial. The Holocaust has been a myth that the Jews invented. At the same time, by the way, Hamas also justifies the Holocaust. Well, Hamas writers have justified the Holocaust as a, a rightful punishment for the Jews, uh, for their crimes against humanity, also, by the way, for their crimes against Germany. Uh, Jews have stabbed Germany in the back, they, responded, they conspired against Germany, uh, etc. I would say also, this is not unique to Hamas. Practically all modern Islamist movements today uh, deny the Holocaust on the one hand and justify it. They reconcile this contradiction by simply saying that, yes, Hitler uh, punished the Jews, but that does, does not mean that he uh, murdered six millions, okay? probably much lower number. Uh, so 
The first element here, which I mentioned, is that uh, uh, is the demonization of the Jews in uh, in Hamas uh, ideology. Uh, this is one element of Hamas. The other element of Hamas ideology is uh, nationalizing Palestinian nationalism, uh, Islamizing Palestinian nationalism. That is describing Palestinian nationalism as basically inherently uh, with Islamic content. An important part of it is the sanctification of the land of Palestine as a holy land of Islam, based on the sanctity of Al-Aqsa Mosque. And uh, one element, another element is the, that uh, Palestine is a holy Muslim endowment. Third element is that the land of Palestine has been saturated with the blood of Muslims uh, who fought for Islam. Palestine is the key area of the struggle between Islam and the West. The battle between Islam and the West will be decided in the land of Palestine. The loss of Palestine for the Muslims meant the loss of their other defeats all over the world, and the regaining of Palestine will bring about Islam, the victory of Islam in other areas as well, in other continents as well. So Palestine here is the key for the salvation of Islam uh, in general. Without Palestine, Islam is dead. If you add these two elements together, you come to the another point is uh, what should be done with the, our conflict with the Jews. Now, Hamas rejects any kind of peaceful settlement with Israel. The only possible settlement which Hamas would uh, agree for was that Israel, that the Jews would agree to dismantle Israel peacefully and agree to live as subject minority under Islam. Since the Jews rejected this offer and insist on having their state, it means that the Jews are waging a, a battle against Islam. The Jews are the offenders and Muslims defend themselves. Under such circumstances, Muslims have no other choice but to wage a jihad against the Jews. Because the Jews are the off uh, offenders and Muslims defend themselves, this jihad is what we call in Islam an individual duty. It is incumbent upon every able-bodied Muslim man to take part in this jihad. Equally important, the struggle against the, the jihad against the Jews will not only rejuvenate the, Muslim, the Palestinian nation, but it will also serve to bring the entire Muslim world back to Islam. It will be the element that will unify the entire Muslim world uh, uh, once again and bring it, uh, uh, allow it to bring victory. Final point here is the outcome of the jihad. And here I would say, uh, uh, Hamas made it very clear, because the Jews have been waging a war against Islam, because the Jews are the offenders or have rebelled against Islam, because the Jews have uh, um, rejected or came out against the punishment by God, the Jews have been punished by God to be dispersed and humiliated among the nations and humiliated among the nations, the Jews wage a war against God. And therefore, the Jews forfeited their right to live as a protected minority under Islam. Therefore, the only deserving punishment for the Jews is total extermination. Hamas says explicitly they do not distinguish between Zionists and Jews, and the punishment should be for all Jews all over the world. Recently, by the way, Yahya Senwar made a small uh, exception. He said that after they destroy Israel, they will allow a certain number of Jews to survive, uh, Jews with special qualifications, such as doctors and engineers, who would then serve the Muslims, you can say, as semi-slaves, to uh, compensate for what all the things that Jews have, uh, uh, all the wrongs Jews have done for Islam. So they would allow a, a small number of Jews to survive. Equally important, Hamas hinged uh, the redemption of the world on eliminating the Jews. Hamas revived an old tradition which had existed in Islam but never played a central place, which in Islam is called the promise of the tree and the rock, or wa'ad al-shajar wal-hajar. This is a, a saying attributed to the Prophet Muhammad that, they, that the day of judgment will not come until the day when the Muslims will fight the Jews and kill them all. In this day, the Jews will flee and they will hide behind trees and rocks. But then God will open the mouth of every tree and every rock and they will say, O Muslim, O slave of God, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Except for one tree called Gharkad, uh, apparently the salt bush, 
the sayings, the uh, traditional sayings uh, ends with look behind this tree. Now, you can say that this is merely uh, a myth or rhetoric. But if you look at sermons by Hamas leaders in Hamas mosques, broadcasted on Hamas TV, as early, as late as, I would say, uh, early 2023, 20, even later, you will hear you will hear Hamas speech, uh, preachers who say who repeat this uh, tradition, and who and and one of them says from one of them the senior Hamas preacher says, why do you think the Israelis are so obsessed about planting trees in Israel? Because they know that this tradition is true. They know that this tradition will be will eventually take place. This promise. Therefore, they prepare the trees to hide behind them for the day that we will come and kill them. The point I want to make here is that this genocidal rhetoric is not simply rhetoric. It is something that is being repeated by Hamas senior leaders and other publications. I'm also saying it because it contradicts, not once, but many times, the document that Hamas published in 2017 in English, I would say for gullible Westerners, in which Hamas claimed that they are no longer anti-Semites, they only fight the Zionists. What I'm trying to say here is that Hamas speaks in double language. One language in English for Westerners, another language in Arabic to its own constituents. We know from experience in the Middle East that what matters is what you speak in, your, in Arabic, to your own constituents. This is eventually what matters. To conclude this point, Hamas starts with a religious struggle, but ends with the call or with the promise to exterminate the Jews as a people. Let me also say, this is the first time in modern history after the Holocaust, when major ideological movements, not only Hamas, but also other Islamic movements, openly and unequivocally speak about the extermination of another people. And by the way, and unlike the Nazis, they don't use euphemisms of final solution, resettlement, or special handling. They say explicitly the need to exterminate the Jews. In a way, they've broken a certain, I would say, not only taboo, but a certain moral or psychological threshold when they openly speak about an exter exterminating a, a, a total people. Okay, I will stop here. Uh, for the time being. As I said at the outset, each of the speakers today uh, uh, will offer uh, uh, ideas for discussion that could take us, uh, uh, that we could spend a great deal of time on. And so, um, though uh, Russell Litbeck's uh, uh, comments uh, re require considerable discussion. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn next to uh, uh, Norman Goda. Um, Professor Goda is the um, uh, Norman and Irma Brayman Professor of Holocaust Studies and the director of the Shorenstein Center of Jewish Studies for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, he studies modern European history and the history of the Holocaust war crimes trials, and 20th century diplomacy. He just courses on the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, his uh, book, The Holocaust, Europe, the World, and the Jews, uh, first in 2013, and I think again in 2023, uh, is a splendid book um, uh, that has very uh, fresh and interesting things to say about very famous issues. Um, uh, he has written uh, essays on the legal issues raised by the war in, in Gaza and is uh, completing a, histor uh, a book, uh, a, a history of the Klaus Barbie trial uh, in France, which is forthcoming. So, uh, Professor Goda, Norman, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, uh, Jeff, for um, the kind introduction and for inviting me. And, and thank you, Jonathan um, and, and Yivo, for hosting this series. It's an honor to be um, on a panel as distinguished as this one. Uh, my subject, everybody, is uh, genocide as an anti-Zionist slash anti-Semitic libel. 
the charge of genocide levied by activists, politicians, and certain countries against Israel after October 7th has weaponized the term in public discourse. Jeffrey Rubenstein of NYU calls it a new blood libel. I want to hit some historical points linking Jews to the charges of genocide because the current wave, while very widespread owing to advanced sloganeering and I would say abuse of the international judicial system, are not new. Jews in Israel have long been seen by anti-Semites as vengeful to the point of exterminating civilians. One could go back to medieval ritual murder charges and charges concerning the poisoning of wells during the Black Death to argue that Jews in anti-Semitic folklore harbored hatred of the rest of mankind. But recent history is also critical. In the Nazi mind, the Germans were not murdering Jews, but defending themselves against Jewish plots to exterminate the Germans. As Heinrich Himmler said in his famous October 1943 Posen speech, we had the moral right, we had the duty to our people to kill this people that wanted to kill us. Owing to the Zionist desire for a Jewish commonwealth in Palestine, these ideas showed up in the Arab world. In, President, uh, in 1943, President Franklin Roosevelt hoped to press King Abdulaziz ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia to approve the movement of Jewish refugees to Palestine at the end of the war. The king was the sole U.S. client in the region. Roosevelt hoped to persuade him, given growing U.S. financial aid to Saudi Arabia. But as Ibn Saud said in a letter to Roosevelt in late April 1943, and I quote him, the Arabs should not be exterminated for the sake of the Jews, unquote. That the Saudi king would use the term exterminated for imagined Jewish perpetrators when the gist of the Holocaust was known even in the Arab world, while the SS was crushing the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt, and while fewer than half a million Jews lived in mandatory Palestine, suggests that the very sovereign status for Jews in the Middle East was synonymous with the genocide of Arabs. In fact, Saudi Arabia in November of 1946 produced the first draft of what two years later became the Genocide Convention. The Saudi draft defined genocide as, quote, mass killings of a group, people, or nation, unquote, without qualifiers of ethnicity or religion. And it also included something else not found in the finished convention, namely, and I quote, the planned disintegration of the political, social, or economic structure of a group, people, or nation, unquote, and quote, acts of terrorism committed for the purpose of creating a state of common danger and alarm in a group, unquote. Did this Saudi draft refer to intensified Irgun terror against the British authorities in Palestine earlier that year? The irony is that the phrase did fit later strategies by the Palestine Liberation Organization and, of course, Hamas. The UN discussions that led to the Genocide Convention's final text are also instructive. The General Assembly's December 1946 draft included only, and I quote, the denial of the right of existence of entire human groups, unquote. After a committee of experts, including Raphael Lemkin, elaborated the definition in 1947, Secretary General Trigva Lee argued that genocide should be limited to, as he said, and I quote, the deliberate destruction of a human group. Otherwise, there is the danger that the idea of genocide could be expanded indefinitely. International law must be built up on a rational and logical basis and exclude arbitrary opinions, unquote. Moreover, Lee said, and I quote, if the notion of genocide were excessively wide, the success of the convention for the punishment of what is perhaps the most odious international crime would be jeopardized, unquote. And war itself, Lee added, was not genocidal on its own merits. 
the infliction of losses, he said, and I quote, even heavy losses on the civilian population in the course of operations of war does not, as a rule, constitute genocide, unquote. War and genocide intersected only when a belligerent aimed at extermination rather than military objectives. International criminal tribunals have indeed cautiously ruled within these guardrails. Yet the Genocide Convention was also viewed from the start as a political tool even before its inception. In an October 1948 UN committee meeting, which was completing the convention text, Syrian delegate Salah Adin Tarazi insisted that the phrase in Article 1, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, should be expanded by the phrase, or at any moment. The reason, Tarazi said, was what he called the illegal status of Israel. The attack launched by the Arab states against Israel in May 1948 was, as he said, and I quote, not a war but an attempt at restoring law and order, unquote. Meanwhile, he noted, and I quote, the Jews had committed atrocities against the Arabs during the campaign, and those crimes deserve to be punished, unquote. But Arab attempts to include displacement in the definition of genocide was rejected by a vote of 29 to 5 with eight abstentions. Genocide as a charge against Israel exploded, in June 1982, with Israel's invasion of Lebanon in an attempt to destroy the PLO's substantial military infrastructure there. There has never been agreement on civilian casualties. In September of 82, Yasser Arafat of the PLO claimed there were 49,000. A later Lebanese police study counted 19,000. But there are numerous statements in UN debates speaking of Israel's targeting of women and children and the genocide of Palestinians. I will read but one, there are many, but I'll read but one from Adnan Omran of the Arab League and the UN General Assembly because it enunciates a key point. Israel was not a state carrying out a genocide. Israel was a genocidal state. Here's the quote. The structure of the Israeli entity, Omran said, is built on the tenets of a Zionist racist settler ideology and the premise of a chosen people, a premise that makes Zionist decision makers believe that they and their people alone are superior to all other people on earth, that they have the right to commit the crime of genocide, thus perpetuating all the crimes of Nazism, unquote. In December, the UN General Assembly labeled the September massacres in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps carried out by Maronite Christian militiamen allied with Israel as, quote, an act of genocide. In his definitive study, Genocide in International Law, William Shabbos writes that there was no legal precision to the resolution. Genocide as a term, he said, and I quote, was obviously chosen to embarrass Israel, unquote. Which brings us to Israel's current war with Hamas. Days after the Hamas massacres of October 7th, before Israel had launched a ground attack in Gaza, Holocaust historian Roz Siegel called the Israel campaign, and I quote, a textbook case of genocide unfolding in front of our eyes, unquote. We can discuss later the problem of Holocaust historians accusing Israel of genocide. The immediate problem, though, is the catch-all approach which Trigva Lee warned about in 1947, almost four decades ago. For Siegel and others, proof of Israel's genocidal intent comes from so-called, quote, dehumanizing statements, unquote. They cite, among others, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, who said two days after the Hamas massacre, we are fighting human animals. Now, dehumanizing language can be said to illegally incite genocide. But the statements by Gallant and others referred to Hamas, not Gazans at large, and were made in a moment of shock, shame, and amidst combat within Israel's borders. 
Israeli forces targeting Hamas urged Gaza civilians with thousands of leaflets and texts to leave fire zones. In fact, the one document in this entire catastrophe that demonstrates genocidal intent is the Hamas Charter of 1988, available in English to anybody with a cell phone. The other part of this cut and paste approach to genocide are Gazan civilian casualty figures, the only source for which is the Gaza Health Ministry, which serves under Hamas. University of Pennsylvania statistician Abraham Weiner showed last month that the death figures, then numbered at 30,000, 70% of which were to have been women and children, cannot be real because they increase by the same percentage daily with no variation to account for the ebbs and flows of war. And that if they were real, it would be statistically impossible for Israel to have killed any adult male civilians. Dehumanizing speech stitched to these casualty figures led to the culmination of the genocide charge, namely South Africa's application to the International Court of Justice in December of 2023. The application was not a legal, but a political act, demanding a ceasefire and withdrawal of Israeli forces with no steps to be taken by Hamas. It cites statements from Iran, Turkey, Algeria, Iraq, and the Palestinian Authority that Israel's actions are genocidal. How these amount to evidence is not clear. It also uses past UN fact-finding reports to establish a pattern of Israel's genocidal behavior, including one from 2015 that predicted Gaza would be uninhabitable by, uninhabitable by 2020. In fact, the population grew, and another from 2009 that was later retracted by its own head of mission, Richard Goldstone, owing to its flawed methodology and overtly political char character. The rest consists of repetitions of dehumanizing statements with citations to what are called UN flash reports that in turn cite casualty figures from the Gaza Health Ministry. And yet despite this, the ICJ, which is not a fact-finding criminal court, found according to its own plausibility standard, and we can talk about that later, that, quote, at least some of the acts and omissions alleged by South Africa appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Genocide Convention, unquote. The court ordered provisional measures which fall short of South Africa's request, but which reinforce the plausibility of genocide by insisting that Israel refrain from genocidal acts. Legally, this would never prove genocide for the International Criminal Court. Propagandistically, however, it is significant. A series of UN experts, including Francesca Albanese, the, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Palestine, claimed that the decision was, quote, a significant milestone in the decades-long struggle for justice by the Palestinian people, unquote, and that the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, categorically dismissed Israel's justifications of its actions as self-defense. That the court did not actually do this is beside the point. And so what to do? And I'll end with this. The Genocide Convention remains a critical legal tool, and, and anyone who doesn't do so or doesn't think so should look at the actual cases by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda or the International Criminal Court. But the Genocide Convention has also been politicized since the convention's earliest days. We cannot just roll our eyes. We must take these distortions seriously because like other anti-Semitic slash anti-Zionist tropes, they metastasize and they can turn violent. A start would be this. As scholars, we know about UN hypocrisy going back to the 1960s, and we know about the non-existent distinctions between anti-Zionism on the one hand and anti-Semitism in the other. 
What we need to understand better right now is why the charge of genocide has exploded the way it has and how, particularly among very loud activists who do not wish us well. For this, genocide is indeed the latest incarnation of the blood libel. Thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you uh, very much again. And again, I make the point that I made uh, after Meyer Litvak's remarks that clearly uh, we could spend a great deal of time uh, talking about Norman Goda's uh, uh, examination of the genocide accusation. Uh, uh, again, I stress, as I did at the outset, that I urge listeners uh, to pay attention to the written work um, of uh, of of uh, of our panelists, uh, so you can read it uh, and and give it the uh, the quiet attention uh, that uh, that reading permits. Uh, the um, now uh, I am uh, pleased uh, to um, introduce uh, Karen Steigner uh, and uh, the um, just a moment. Uh, she is professor of sociology. Uh, at the uh, University of Passau in Germany. Um, uh, just a moment. Um, uh, and yes, and she has published extensively uh, in in German on a social and critical theory. Uh, uh, dealing with issues such as anti-Semitism and sexism, uh, religion, secularization. Uh, she's published a book about the uh, uh, gender and secularization debates that took place during uh, uh, debates about Turkey's possible membership in the European Union. She has published uh, extensively in English in scholarly journals uh, dealing with questions of feminism, intersectionality, gender, and uh, anti-Semitism. And uh, she is part of a mid-career generation of now tenured professors uh, in Germany uh, who uh, are, I think, uh, members of a distinctive liberal tradition, uh, left liberal, right liberal, you, you, you define it, uh, that doesn't exist to the, quite the same extent uh, in the United States um, and is, a, is a, in my view, a huge blast of fresh air. Uh, so the floor is yours, Professor Steigner. You're, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and um, for um, and for this uh, wonderful panel. I'm going to talk about the connections between uh, anti-Semitism and sexism, and I'm going to talk about the feminist reactions to um, the October 7 terrorist attacks. Those attacks uh, that were the deadliest attack on Jewish life since the Holocaust but they were also a demonstration of a monstrous ideological mix in which exterminatory antisemitism and extreme misogyny permeate each other. Israeli women's organizations immediately after the 7 October started to carry out meticulous forensic work to investigate the sexual violence component of the antisemitic act of October 7. And by contrast, Leading international women's organizations, such as the UN Women, remained silent for weeks, if not months, and refused to express solidarity with Israeli women. Eventually, uh, the silence turned into relativism and even outright denial of Hamas's rape of Israeli women. As recently as March 2024, Judith Butler, one of the most prominent queer feminists worldwide, publicly questioned whether the rape had taken place and called for clear evidence. And this is something feminists have been fighting against for decades. And just recently, more than 1,600 so-called feminists from around the world signed an open letter accusing Israel of using the issue of rape as a racist weapon to dehumanize Palestinians and divert attention from the alleged genocide. 
At the same time, the letter fails to unconditionally condemn the Hamas rapists and express sympathy for the Israeli rape victims and the Israeli hostages still in the hands of Hamas. The letter insinuates that condemning Hamas rape would be just another instance of pinkwashing. Such reactions from intersectional and queer feminists in the USA and Europe are alarming, but not entirely unexpected. Rather, they are in line with an international trend of feminist campaigning for Palestine that has been going on for about two decades. Intersectional and queer feminist movements are committed to the boycott divestment sanctions campaign. And the specific alliance between intersectional and queer feminist movements with BDS runs under the label queer BDS or queers for BDS. And one of the consequences of this alliance has been that the agenda of promoting women's rights and LGBTIQ rights and the demand for sexual self-determination has been sidelined in favor of Palestinian national self-determination, notwithstanding the deep misogyny and homophobia of Hamas and other Islamist terror groups. There is no longer a common cause in queer BDS. What remains is a common foe, namely Israel. In this ideological cosmos, it is something even, it is sometimes even considered racist to denounce Hamas's rapes. So this raises the question of what has happened to feminism. According to intersectionality, women have to fight not only sexism, but also other forms of oppression. Thus, anti-racism is also a feminist concern. And the background of this legitimate demand is that women themselves do not form a homogeneous group, but are subject to different forms of discrimination, exploitation, and oppression worldwide. However, in this intersectional perspective, Racism is being reduced to the color line, thus blinding out antisemitism. In this framework, this intersectional framework, Jews seem at best to have no particular place, but mostly they are simply subsumed under whiteness and thus seen as privileged. So, part of the problem that the Jewish experience with antisemitism is regularly excluded from intersectional feminism is that the complex relationship between racism and antisemitism is not recognized. Antisemitism is seen as a mere form of racism and thus as a problem of Nazis or other far right racists, at least nothing that would concern the left or feminists or anti-racists. In this way, post-national forms of anti-Semitism, such as, as those related to Israel, are not recognized and not seen as a problem that intersectionality needs to deal with. Rather, these forms of anti-Semitism are reinterpreted as the outcry of the oppressed in the global south. In order to analytically and practically counter the exclusion of the Jewish experience of antisemitism from the intersectional framework, it is necessary to reflect on the specificity of antisemitism in relation to racism. So let me just outline this difference a little bit. Both colonial and apartheid racism are based on the hierarchical construction of supposedly superior and inferior races. The racialized other is constructed as primitive, as inferior, and represents a lack of civilization and modernity. The racists themselves uh, see themselves as representatives of civilization and feel superior. Racism does not operate with conspiracy myths, those myths that um, Meyer has uh, just uh, talked about. Um, racialized people are not seen as um, secretly ruling the world, the world as controlling the media and finance, and as accelerating the processes of modernization, globalization, and cosmopolitanism. Such conspiracy myths, as we have heard, are an essential feature of anti-Semitism. Of anti-Semitism, and there is one of the big differences between anti-Semitism and racism, which we need to consider. 
So racism is very much about legitimizing the economic exploitation and social discrimination of racialized and colonized people. Antisemitism, by contrast, assumes that Jews possess an intangible power that is omnipresent and to which anti-Semites feel not superior, but anti-Semites feel inferior to Jews. So anti-Semitism is largely about projecting responsibility for exploitation and inequality onto Jews. Jews appear as representatives of an exploitative, structurally racist group, and Israel appears as a bastion of Western imperialism in the Middle East, an artificial and alien element in the midst of supposedly indigenous Arab peoples. Another problem that we are witnessing um, is an extreme form of, of what Elsa Frankel Brunswick called the intolerance of ambiguity. And the intolerance of ambiguity means that people are less and less able to perceive the world as ambiguous, meaning that one and the same problem has several sides. Instead, people are incre increasingly adhere to a Manichaean worldview that neatly organizes everything along the clear lines of good versus evil, victim versus perpetrator, global south versus the, the west. And in this mindset, in this Manichaean mindset, the Palestinians appear as the perfect and pure victims. And as victims, they cannot possibly be anti-Semitic. And if they are, it is because of their being victimized. This serves the anti-Western need for unambiguity, for purity, and for clarity, and is furthermore a paternalistic stance toward Palestinians who are thoroughly infantilized. So one of the key problems is that two forms of anti-Semitism are consistently obscured and denied. The first form is Israel-related anti-Semitism, and the second is Islamic anti-Semitism. So I think that this is one particular background of anti intersectionality being increasingly politically misused and offering an opening to anti-Semitism. I argue for a critical reclaiming of the approach, not only to avoid the pitfalls, but to place the analysis of anti-Semitism at the very heart of intersectionality. The critical theory of the Frankfurt School, especially the studies in the authoritarian personality carried out in the US in the 1940s can be helpful in this. I cannot go into too much detail here, but I would like to mention that one of the most important discoveries in these studies was that ideologies such as anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, homophobia, ethnocentrism, nationalism, and the legitimation of class inequality, that all those different ideologies rarely occur as isolated phenomena, but develop within a broader framework. And this broader framework um, is called the authoritarian ideological syndrome. So ideologies are certainly intersectional. Um, they permeate and reinforce each other. Antisemitism appears here as a master ideology in the sense that it entails a whole worldview that operates with moments that may not in itself, in themselves be anti-Semitic, but rather sexist, homophobic, or nationalistic, or also post-nationalistic. So we see that antisemitism is itself an intersectional ideology. And let me give you an example for this. In Hamas's ideology, the well-being of the world depends on the annihilation of Jews and on extreme misogyny. And this shows in Hamas's rape as a manifestation of threefold hatred. The victim is Israeli, which is hatred of the state. She is Jewish, which is anti-Semitism. And thirdly, the, the victim is a woman, which is misogyny. It was no coincidence that Hamas attacked a music festival where young, secular, and sexually free Israelis were celebrating. They stand for modern life, freedom, and equality, and the Islamists hate all that. The fusion of sexuality and nihilistic worship of death 
is a central socio-psychological pattern in sexism, anti-feminism, homophobia, or transphobia. And these ideologies regularly act as a hinge to anti-Semitism. There is a connection to anti-Semitism. For example, Islamist anti-Semitism is inseparable from an Islamist cult of masculinity and death, evident in a hatred of a certain image of the West and of its ideals. And these ideals are individual freedom, sexual self-determination, gender equality, and the desire and striving for emancipation and happiness of the individual. And this hatred is equally expressed in the murder of Jews and the murder of emancipated women, since both stand for these hated ideals of freedom and happiness. In antisemitism and misogyny, the desire for freedom and emancipation itself is eradicated. And this shows in jihadist Islamism, where anti-Semitism, gender apartheid, and the devastating hatred of LGBTQ people are directly linked. And this is a kind of form of intersectional ideology critique that makes this evident. And this is a form of intersectionality that deviates considerably from uh, the other forms that are so um, uh, so uh, so broadly received today and which have an open uh, flank to uh, anti-Semitism. So this brings me to my cl concluding remarks. Because as you have might have seen, I want to rescue intersectionality for an anti for a critique of anti-Semitism. And I also want to rescue an uh, intersectionality uh, because it is it, it has really um, it is um, it, it is a tool for analyzing modern um, systems of domination. And the political claim of intersectionality includes solidarity with the oppressed. But this requires a consistent intersectional analysis of power relations, not only between majority and minority, but of power relations also within minorities. Thus, intersectional feminists should support those Palestinian voices who want to live a free and self-determined life beyond Islamist virtue signaling terror. Intersectional feminists should recognize that Palestinian national self-determination is not the same as sexual self-determination for Palestinians. Intersectional feminists should not allow the agenda of women's rights and LGBTQ rights to be sidelined and hate for Israel to eclipse solidarity with Israeli women and the LGBTIQ people. Otherwise, intersectionality does mm -hmm. not deserve the name, but becomes a mere slogan and an alibi for hatred of Israel. I thank you very much for your attention. Karen, uh, Professor Snogda, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, I hope there are sociological theorists here in the United States who are listening to this uh, webinar and uh, uh, I hope that your your work and your your essays becomes uh, 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 even more well known uh, in in uh, in the English speaking world. Uh, thank you for the splendid presentation, uh, uh, I, Jonathan. Uh, I, it, although the panelists have been very disciplined, and uh, um, I would request that we extend. Uh, the session another 10 minutes or so so that David Hirsch has the same amount of time uh, as the previous panelists. Uh, uh, we could spend the whole afternoon discussing the ideas that have been raised. Um, uh, uh, let me in introduce uh, David Hirsch. Uh, uh, David, Professor Hirsch is also a friend. Um, uh, a very brave man and a fine scholar. is the senior lecturer in sociology at Goldsmith University in London. His publications include the 2017 book, Contemporary Left Antisemitism. For those of you who have not read it and are interested in British politics uh, or the British Labour Party during the Corbyn era uh, uh, or the period in which uh, Ken Livingston was the mayor of London, I urge you very strongly to read Contemporary Left Antisemitism. He is the author of the 2023 edited collection, The Rebirth of Antisemitism in the 20th century, 21st Century, from the academic boycott campaign into the mainstream. And he has played a leading role, uh, from a distance it seems the leading role, in the founding 
of the London Center for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. There is a website at the London Center for the Study of Anti Con Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. Mm -hmm. I urge those of you who are watching today uh, to check it out. Uh, the floor is yours, David. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, thank you, colleagues. Um, good afternoon. So uh, after, in fact, uh, in our three volume anthology, uh, responding to the 7th of October, which will be out in June. Um, the French sociologist Danny Trom uh, asks the question that we're all asking, really, which is uh, what was new or unique <clears throat> about the events of the 7th of October? And actually, I kept hearing people assert that it was uh, unique and it was a turning point, and I wasn't sure why it's not that i wanted to deny it i just wanted to work out why and how and danny's answer was <clears throat> to say that on the morning of october the 7th jews in the south of israel near gaza had a particular experience and the experience was of calling for help and of there being no help there, no help coming, no help available. <clears throat> Danny says during the interminable hours of the massacre, the typically Jewish isolation has echoed within us. And literally, you know, Jews were on the phone asking, where, where is the police? Where is the, the army? And it was not there. And Danny says that this is a kind of classic diaspora experience connecting today's Israelis right back to uh, pre-Israel experiences. And I think by the same token, really, it connects many Jews who had not yet felt connected in this way back to Israel and not through any particular positive self-identification with Israel, but through a hostile identification from outside that gives Jews the choice <clears throat> of disavowing Israel and joining um, the uh, denunciations of genocide and child murder or standing in the dock for Israel and answering for its crimes, uh, real, imagined <clears throat> or exaggerated. Anthony Julius, also in uh, our um, three-volume anthology, talks about the effect on UK British Jews. And he says that they found themselves alienated from the institutions of the British state that they were accustomed to regarding as there for their protection. Um, <clears throat> and he mentions some... Uh, he talks about the BBC, about the, I mean, the BBC has been extraordinary, I think. Of course, discussions about balance always depend on the point around which one finds balance. Um, the thing about the BBC uh, coverage of the war is that it didn't cover the war. The BBC covered events simply as a, a, a kind of random or unconnected series of personal disasters. And, <clears throat> of course, the personal disasters are real. But in telling the story in that way, you can't make any sense of it. <laughs> Nobody can really understand what was going on. And there have been, uh, I don't know, more than 250 uh, young Israeli, ma mainly men and women, um, killed in the battle against Hamas. But on the BBC, there is no battle. <laughs> there is just human rights abuses. So it's, a, it's quite a strange kind of progression, actually. There was a time when nobody cared really about civilian uh, uh, casualties or atrocities. Um, people said, well, this is just war. And then um, with the Geneva Conventions and the Genocide Conventions, Rightly, we became concerned about the laws of war, what may or may not be done during war. And it feels like 
now the war itself is completely lost and all we have left is the uh, crimes against civilians. And they are all kind of equal to each other and none of them explain anything that is going on. Um, Anthony talks about the Metropolitan Police and the universities and the schools, even uh, the Football Association and the famous Wembley Arch, which generally lights up in the colours of a country which is subjected to a uh, terrorist attack, and they did not do so for Israel. And also to the international institutions, uh, the United Nations, the NGOs, the news organisations, also people began to feel abandoned by the institutions that they looked to to keep them safe, and people began to feel abandoned by their fellow citizens and more and more by their fellow colleagues. We were used to that in the humanities, in academic academia, but in more and more professions, more and more workplaces, um, people have been abandoned because their colleagues are saying quite clearly that Israel is committing genocide, Israel is deliberately murdering thousands of children. And as both uh, Mayor Litvak and Norman uh, said, um, this is a version of the blood libel. There is no truth in it. And um, it portrays Israel as uniquely evil and in the particular way in which Jews have always been portrayed as uniquely evil by saying that they murder children for no reason and just out of pure malice. Um, One day, uh, a couple of months ago, anti-Semitism was actually at the top of the news agenda in Britain. It was in on the, in the Today programme, it was uh, on the front page of the Times and the Daily Express. So I thought to myself, well, maybe it's not so bad as I thought, <laughs> you know, that it's been taken seriously. And then I actually realised that, that there was a complete confusion about it, that on the Today programme, they were talking about, you know, where does this terrible anti-Semitism come from? Who are the anti-Semites? But every other day, they were say they were, you know, operating with a discourse in which Israel was murdering children for no reason. And then on this day, they're asking, well, where does the anti-Semitism come from? And of course, from anti-Semitic discourse comes anti-Semitic actions and identities. Last weekend, perhaps we felt a little bit uh, that Israel was no longer abandoned in that way. The the kind of, and sometimes Jews are so easily pleased, you know, uh, some RAF planes and some French aircraft and some US aircraft um, helped the defense of Israel. The Jordanians and the Saudis opened their airspace. Actually, you know, significant actions and also perhaps a, a success for the Israeli forces uh as the 7th of october was a was a scandalous failure but then immediately uh discourse was being pushed again by the experts by the governments by the news organizations um israel started this cycle and iran has retaliated because it had to to save face and that will be the end of it and if israel carries on then it will again be responsible so a kind of moment when people felt a little bit of international solidarity followed by a, another kind of disavowal. We had always said in 1948, in 1967, in 1973, that if Israel had been defeated, um, huge numbers of Jews would have been murdered. And people had trouble really believing that. They kind of thought, well, you know, people win and lose wars all the time and it's not always catastrophic. And we pointed out what Mayor Levak has said about the Hamas Charter, and we said, take Hamas seriously. They mean it. They have a relationship back to Nazi Germany, and they repeat Nazi genocidal discourse. And people said, well, yeah, yeah, but really they only want uh, freedom for the Palestinian people. And perhaps there was a moment on the 7th of October when we thought, well, now at least our neighbours and our compatriots can see what we were worried about, that we were not just being silly. And so the discovery that uh, 
many of them didn't. <laughs> and many of them uh, celebrated or trivialized or denied or inverted back onto Israel the uh, attack of the 7th of October made people, I think a lot of Jews, a lot of people kind of realize, oh, they will never get it. <laughs> no matter what evidence there is, um, it will never change some people's minds, which is for sure the way with anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism projects the actions, fantasies, or intentions of the anti-Semites onto the Jews. Anti-Semites fantasize and plan genocide and they accuse the Jews of genocide. Anti-Semites fantasize and plan the murder of children and they accuse the Jews of murdering children. So what anti-Semitism does actually is it removes Jews from the communities of common humanity. Um, people might have heard of what I call the Livingston formulation. Um, after the mayor of London from some time ago, Ken Livingston, he didn't invent it, he didn't pioneer it, but he used it and I noticed it with him actually when he said this. For far too long, the accusation of anti-Semitism has been used against anyone who is critical of the policies of the Israeli government, as I have been. And what I realized when I heard him say that was that this is becoming, has become a standard response to anyone who talks about contemporary anti-Semitism. The standard response is, ha, we know what you're up to when you say that you feel or you understand anti-Semitism, what you're up to, is trying to label criticism of Israel as though it was anti-Semitic and thereby to delegitimize and to silence it. And you are playing the anti-Semitism card, you are crying wolf, and actually very many responses to those of us who work in the field of contemporary anti-Semitism or those activists who oppose contemporary anti-Semitism, they get faced with this conspiracy fantasy which says you're just trying to delegitimize uh, criticism of Israel. And that is the, the shape actually of very, very much contemporary discourse. Antisemitism is, a, is that collective agreement to treat Jews as being supporters of evil that ejects them from the places where they thought they were at home it is a painful and alienating exclusion. It breaks friendships, reputations, careers and families, relationships on which Jews had relied and which they thought were solid. Anti-Semitic Christian traditions had long used their own images of the Jew to represent and symbolize evil in the world, which is otherwise difficult to picture and to pin down. The Jews were dehumanized, portrayed with claws and horns, made into the devil and accused of absolute evil. The purest version of which is the deliberate murder of innocent non-Jewish children. This created a face for the evil that stood between the good people and the good life they deserve. George Orwell understood the function for the 20th century totalitarians of the face of the treacherous Jew, the enemy of the people, in his novel 1984, Orwell imagined the party naming the traitor, the enemy of Big Brother, Emmanuel Goldstein, and organizing a daily cathartic two minutes hate in every workplace of the image of Goldstein. There is a relationship between the social alienation of Jews who are faced by the hostile assumption that they are Zionist, by which is meant in this context, racist and supporters of genocide, and the pure and physical absolute alienation of Jews who find themselves literally and completely abandoned and beyond help when their social alienation is transformed into 
alienation from humanity itself. Thank you, David. Um, that's the sobering words. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, another 10, maybe 15 minutes. Um, and uh, Jonathan is going to be uh, addressing uh, questions that, that that you have sent in. Uh, I have, I'd like to ask Meyer Litvak, um, it's, it's understandable uh, that uh, uh, Western governments, uh, Europe, the United States, uh, might underestimate uh, or not take seriously uh, the issues that you raise uh, about Hamas and its Manichaean absolutism. Uh, yet, uh, according to press reports, um, the government of Israel uh, in the last 10, 15 years uh, seemed to place its hopes uh, in um, uh, Hamas moderating, uh, or um, uh, it, it does not, one does not get the impression that the in the inner circles of power uh, in Jerusalem, uh, Meyer Litvak's understanding of Hamas was uh, the coin of the realm. I wonder if could you talk, uh, I, and again, I know you could talk for a long time about this, but could you talk very briefly uh, about the the reaction of the Israeli government to Hamas in recent decades. And you're, mu you're muted, Meyer. I would make a distinction between two views. One view, which was uh, common in the, I would say, in the army intelligence and academia, uh, believed that Hamas, once it took power in Gaza, it would have to moderate. It will, because we have to take care of the Palestinian population and providing food, etc. it will moderate. It will ideology is one thing, but it is it could not be implemented. Therefore, Hamas will become moderate. Here, I would say they completely ignore the fact that not all governments become moderate, not all dictators become moderate. We know it from Hitler, Stalin, and Saddam Hussein. Another section uh, did not believe that Hamas would become moderate, but I would have to say, and angrily, they said, you know, well, Hamas is an enemy that is clear. The PLO is a more dangerous enemy because the PLO disguises its enmity. So we prefer Hamas to the PLO because in, with Hamas, we can supposedly deal with, deal with. We'll know how to deal in the future. We'll know how to deal with in the future. So these people prefer to ignore, I would say willfully, the evil of Hamas because they had other political uh, considerations. For the intelligence people, the academia would say it was a failure to truly understand the ideological commitment of Hamas. If I, if I could, I, my impression is that your, what you've just explained uh, about the internal Israeli interpretation of Hamas is not well known in the United States and Europe and Britain. Uh, so I hope that you'll, I hope that you'll elaborate on that. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to pose questions? I don't want to monopolize posing the questions. Um. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists for this really brilliant uh, discussion. We have many, many questions, uh, many good ones, uh, and I, I wish that we were able to get to all of them. I don't think we'll be able to do so. And we, we have maybe at most 10 minutes, uh, but I will uh, select a couple. Uh, that maybe there are some uh, uh, easy ones. Uh, so, uh, Meyer, uh, perhaps you can easily answer, does Hamas want a caliphate? Does Iran, what is the caliphate? Every Islamist movement in the world believes that eventually the Muslim world will be united under the caliphate. However, it is most Islamic movements um, Realize that the caliphate will be at the, in a very long distance. So the mo most Islam soon Islamist movements, I would say, have more practical considerations. Basically, they want to establish Islamic states ruled by Islamic law, right and now, here and now. The caliphate will wait for the distant future. Iranian Shias don't believe in the caliphate. They have a different uh, system. Thank you, uh, Karin. Uh, also, uh, quickly, what uh, what is pink washing? 
uh, pinkwashing is an allegation that um, Israel would utilize uh, the liberal um, legislati legislation concerning LGBTIQ rights, women's rights, only in order to distract from uh, the occupation, to distract from the oppression of Palestinians, mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, in order to denounce the Palestinian other as uh, primitive, as not modern, as uncivilized, and so on. So this is uh, as if Israel would not be, as if the is Israeli um, women and Israeli LGBTIQ would not have fought for their rights and if uh, but if this would just be a strategy in order to distract from something else that's called pinkwashing thank you um uh, david i think this is for you but jeffrey also for you and i think for the entire panel uh it's a very important question from doug in london i see academic and community jews in the explaining context of this war to all but at best we are ignored or treated as delusional at worst attacked often viciously many now have stopped and are reduced to silence how do we get the context out to our wider societies well actually nor i, I i've spoken a lot norman has experience uh, with doing this kind of thing so uh how about if we direct the question to you sure um, I'll, I'll speak as quickly as I can. It's a it's a major problem. Um, I, I would argue that, you know, right now and, and since October 7th, uh, most print forums are Jews speaking to one another. Um, things like Tablet, uh, Brett Stevens' excellent journal, Sapir, um, uh, Mosaic. Um, you know, the, these are these are inter-Jewish um, communications. And so the question is, how do you how do you break through that and into mainstream publications that are a little bit jaundiced to us right now? Certainly things like the Washington Post, the New York Review of Books and that sort of thing. Um, it can be done. That's an exception. I mean, Jeff and I uh, and a number of other scholars, including um, Meyer, Karen and and um, David got got a uh, an open letter into the New York Review of Books um, a couple of months ago, but but it's really a struggle. Um, but I I don't um, I I don't know that that's a reason to give up. I mean I think that these inter-Jewish communications that we have are very important um, in first of all finding one another because we're all in different disciplines. Um, and and sharpening um, our our arguments, uh, but I I don't think we stop uh, trying to get trying to get our stuff out into um, the mainstream public. I, I I would add this, and um, uh, in the the current issue of anti-Semitism studies, there is a collection of reactions after October seventh, and Richard Wolin has a particularly acute essay. I urge people to read it. Um, and I've made this point elsewhere. The what strikes me as one as a defining aspect of the current moment is that whether it's in Europe or Brit uh, Britain should be in the European Union, but it, it, whatever in the uh, Western Europe, uh, the United States, uh, uh, the global liberal democratic world, we'll call it what you will, uh, people especially young people who regard themselves as progressive or left wing, uh, denounce Israel, but not Hamas. And some of them who are more radical even come to the defense of Hamas. So th this is a peculiar moment in history in which people who regard themselves as leftist, like Judith Butler, for example, uh, are coming to the defense of organizations that have their origins in a mixture of religious obscurantism, uh, and uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood, also an alliance with the Nazi regime in the 19, a de facto alliance with the Nazi regime in the 1940s. In other words, their their ideology, their origins, their essence is reactionary. It's not leftist. Uh, and uh, the, the, the discussions today and in the last, the previous two webinars also address in one way or another this issue. How did people who regard themselves as liberals and leftists uh, come to make the case for these reactionary organizations. 
D David, maybe you, given your work on Corbyn and the Labour Party, mm -hmm. uh, you you may have a comment about this. Yeah, um, I I have three things to say actually. One is to kind of warn against feeling completely isolated in public discourse. Um, I don't think we are. Um, I think so. The polling, for example, shows in Britain something like twenty five percent of Brits hold really quite seriously anti-Semitic views, you know, Israel and Nazis and, and the rest of it, about 25% of Brits hold quite seriously clear views on anti-Semitism. And then there's a great big 50% in the middle. So we can exaggerate and probably we shouldn't. And we all uh, also, you know, we all get our message across into the public sphere as well as we can um, through social media, through the, it's a bit uh, denigrating to call them sort of intra-Jewish uh, um, uh, media because you know we get our messages out there as well as we can and we don't do too badly um, uh, in Germany for example there are many people who uh, defend um, democratic discourse secondly um, what we are trying to do uh, as scholars and as the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism is to focus on academic discourse so it's Everybody knows, everybody says that there's a problem of anti-Semitism on campus, and there is, but nobody is really able to get to it. Everybody sort of tries to, to reach students directly or to, to, to educate students or to get into TikTok and social media. But so long as what the students are taught inside the lecture theatre and inside the conferences and the journals and the book publications of the academics, so long as that is anti-Semitic and so long as anti-Semitism is protected and legitimised there, then we are failing to address the key issue. So that's what we try to do. We try to get communities of scholarship and infrastructures of scholarship running because we are largely excluded from them. And uh, that's our project. And it's a huge project and hugely ambitious. And thirdly, I would say simply that anti-Semitism is, I think, always a uh, symptom of anti-democratic thinking and anti-democratic politics. And that is a reason for optimism, too, I think, because it means that we potentially have allies in everybody who defends democracy in everybody who wants to live in a democratic state because uh, anti-Semitism is, is corrosive of the democratic state. So I think we do have many potential allies. It's not as awful as it seems. But then on the other hand, if somebody told me everything's great, then I would tell them that it is awful. So uh, uh, it, it is also awful. Um, I, I want to squeeze in two more questions and 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 therefore Karen and perhaps you can answer quickly uh, but I think they're important uh, from Sonia Michael um, uh, was Hamas's sexual violence spontaneous or pre-planned and how could Muslim men rationalize their acts in light of Islamic prohibitions against sexual promiscuity um well, um, there is evidence that the rape uh, took place not only occasionally, but also uh, rather strategically, um, although this is, of course, difficult to prove because the victims are, most of the victims were murdered, uh, so they cannot uh, speak out uh, anymore. But even UN uh, women have now recognized that there is considerable evidence that this was uh, um, also strategic and whether it was pre-planned I well I don't know but there is also evidence that so there was with one of the rapists uh, who was uh, who was killed uh, one found kind of a glossary with him and uh, a translation from Arabic into Hebrew and it took it, 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 it said take off your pants so that this is in I don't know a, means that there must have been kind of a preparation uh, for this and um how they would i don't know could, could I you know, there is always 
yeah, just one, just one moment. There is always this uh, distinction between good women and bad women. So the good women, uh, they uh, are worshipped, the mothers are worshipped, the Islamic, uh, those women who live uh, according to Islamic uh, rule, uh, they are worshipped. But all those women who don't, all those women who want to live a free life and, and, and want to uh, be autonomous subjects, they are particularly targets uh, of Islamist movements. And in the first place, also of the Iranian movement, the, of, of the Iranian mullahs. So they uh, they uh, talk about that uh, sexually free women are targets. They are seen as a sign of West toxification. They are seen as un-Islamic. And uh, so I think this is, um, it's if Islam says that um, sexual assault is, uh, is not permitted, uh, it depends on how the women themselves are viewed. And there are the good women and the bad women. And this Thank is uh, important. Time. And I think this one moment, one moment. And I think this uh, thing of West toxification is also um, concerning the previous uh, discussion because it is um, it is also the ideology within parts, major parts of the left in the West, a particular anti-Western stance and a particular um, cultural relativist discourse that is going on uh, that uh, there is um, and uh, Jeffrey mentioned uh, Judith Butler there are other women like for example uh, Susan Buckmores who were looking for a um, an alliance between feminism and uh, Islamism um, so or an, an alliance between the left and Islamism, which is called in French Islamo Gushism. So they would, in the end, also uh, legitimize uh, Said Qutub's um, uh, anti Semitism and would uh, see in him um, a critic of modernity comparable to the criticism of modernity from the Frankfurt School. So it is, in the first place, an anti Western stance. And uh, uh, with, uh, with all that uh, cultural relativist um, uh, direction in it. Meyer, yes. uh, go ahead. Could I, one, one sentence, please. Uh, first of all, there have been uh, some of the Hamas prisoners said openly that they were given permission by a Hamas cleric to rape women. This was official. They were, they were given permission. This is what one, several of them said. Secondly, according to Islamic law, or various interpretations of Islamic law, it, it is permissible for the leader of the Islamic nation to enslave women prisoners and enslaving them they can be the, they have the property of their captors and therefore they can be used uh, sex sexually because they belong as as uh, female slaves to their captors another point is that so we, islamic law yes is supposed to protect women's women uh, uh, prisoners however if these women fight against islam they do not deserve any kind of protection According to the Hamas and other Islamic movements, all Israeli women, by definition, either because they served in the army or because they settled in occupied land, fight against Islam. So automatically they become like warriors and therefore they do not deserve any protection, any, any uh, compassion, etc. So they, they do have the legal, I would say, uh, cover, uh, cover to perpetrate what they do. You do have some such interpretations in Islamic law. Thank you. Uh, I suspect that the uh, proposed alliance between uh, the feminists and Islamists will be about as successful as the Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939. Um, let, let me uh, just make well, one brief comment. If there are lawyers or law professors or historians of law who are listening to this webinar, please pay attention to Norman Goda's essays. Um, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, if, if you have not read the Israeli presentations at the International Court of Justice or the brilliant dissent by Julius Sibutende, the judge from Uganda, please read them. Um, uh, they are probably not read often enough, but uh, Goda is a distinctive voice here in defending the rule of law and, and discussing uh, lawfare, uh, both at The Hague and 
and as as the genocide accusations functions as propaganda. With that, I've I've said enough, and we've been going on for a long time. Jonathan, you have the last word. Yes, I, I just want to thank everyone again for this uh, really brilliant seminar. Uh, I hope this is the beginning, not the end, of our conversation. And uh, to David's point about forming a community of scholars, I want Evo to be part of that community, and I want such scholars to feel welcome here. Uh, you've all made extraordinary contributions. Uh, Jeffrey, in particular, I want to thank you for curating this and inviting all of our guests uh, to participate. EVO has become a place where these conversations can happen. I want these conversations to continue, and I want uh, our audience to know that they can all be found on YouTube. Uh, just go to YouTube, uh, look for EVO, and you will find... Uh, uh, these uh, these webinars posted there. That said, uh, thank you all again, and hope to see you all again soon. Bye bye.